Hello, and welcome back to Storytime with Eric Zimmer. Where we last left off in the wonderful story of Henry Sugar, we were learnt. We met Henry and knew what he was like, and he was in the middle of reading a report from an exercise book about an Indian who can see without his eye using his eyes. Reported by a doc by a British doctor stationed in India in the early 1930s. And now we're going to learn more about this incredible Indian fellow. <laughs> you ready? Sure. All right, let's begin. Chapter 3. For the rest of the day, I was kept busy with patients in the hospital. At 6 o'clock in the evening, I came off duty and drove back, back to my flat or apartment, for a shower and a change of clothes. It was the hottest time of year in Bombay, and even after sundown the heat was like an open furnace. Then again, they are closer, and Bombay is probably a lot closer to the equator than England is. But anyways, if you sat still in a chair and did nothing, the sweat would come seeping out of your skin. Your face glistened with dampness all day long, and your shirt stuck to your chest. I took a long, cool shower. I drank a whiskey and soda, sitting on the veranda, with only a towel around my waist. Then I put on some clean clothes. At ten minutes to seven, I was outside the Royal Palace Hall in Acacia Street. It was not much of a place. It was one of those smallish, seedy halls that can be hired inexpensively for meetings or, or dances. There was a fair-sized crowd of local Indians milling around outside the ticket office, and a large poster over the entrance proclaimed that the, inter the International Theatre Company was performing every night that week. It said there would be jugglers and conjurers and acrobats and sword swallowers and fire eaters and snake charmers and a one-act play entitled The Raja and the Tiger Lady. But above all this... And in by far the largest letters it read, Imrat Khan, the miracle man who sees without his eyes. I bought a ticket and went in. The show lasted two hours. To my surprise, I thoroughly enjoyed it. He must not like these kind of performances in general. All the performers were excellent. I liked the man who juggled with cooking utensils. I liked, he had a saucepan, a frying pan, a baking tray, a huge plate, and a casserole pot all flying through the air at the same time. The snake charmer had a big green snake that stood almost on the tip of its tail and swayed to the music of his flute. The fire eater ate fire and the sword swallower pushed a thin pointed rapier at least four feet down his throat and into his stomach. Last of all, to a great fanfare of trumpets, our friend Imrat Khan came on to do his act. The bandages we, we had put on him at the hospital had now been removed. Members of the audience were called on to the stage to blindfold him with sheets and scarves and turbans, and in the end there was so much material wrapped around his head he could hardly keep his balance. He was then given a revolver. A small boy came round and stood at the left of the stage. I recognized him as the one who had held the bicycle outside the hospital that morning. The boy placed a tin can on the top of his head and stood quite still. The audience became deathly silent as Imrat Khan took aim. He fired. The bang made us all jump. The tin can flew off the boy's head and clattered to the floor. The boy picked it up and showed the bullet hole to the audience. Everyone clapped and cheered. The boy smiled. Then the boy stood against a wooden screen, and Imrat Khan threw knives all around his body, most of them going very close indeed. This was a splendid act. Not many people could have thrown knives with such accuracy, even with their eyes uncovered. But there he was, this extraordinary fellow, with his head so swathed in sheets that it looked like a great snowball on a stick. And he was flicking the sharp knives onto, into the screen with a hair's breadth of the boy's head. Within a hair's breadth of the boy's head. The boy smiled all the way through the act, and when it was over, the audience stamped its feet and screamed with excitement. Imrat Khan's last act, though not so spectacular, was even more impressive. A metal barrel was brought on stage. 
The audience was invited to examine it, to make sure there were no holes. There were no holes. The barrow was then placed over Imrat Khan's already bandaged head. It came down over his shoulders and as far as his elbows, pinning the upper part of his arms to his sides. But he could still hold out his forearms and his hands. Someone put a needle in one of his hands and a length of cotton thread in the other. With no false moves, he neatly threaded the cotton through the eye of the needle. I was flabbergasted. As soon as the show was over, I made myself backstage. I found Imrat Khan in a small but clean dressing room, sitting quietly on a wooden stool. The little Indian boy was unwinding the mass of scarves and sheets from around his head. Ah, he said, it is my friend, the doctor from the hospital. Come in, sir, come in. I saw the show, I said. And what did you think? I liked it very much. I thought you were wonderful. Thank you, he said. That is a high compliment. I must congratulate your assistant as well, I said, nodding to the small boy. He is very brave. He cannot speak English, the Indian said, but I will tell you what he said. He spoke rapidly to the boy in Hindustani, and the boy saw, nodded solemnly, but said nothing. <coughs> Look, I said, I did you a small favor this morning. Would you do me one in return? Would you consent to come out and have supper with me? All the wrappings were off his head now. He smiled at me and said, I think you are feeling curious. I is, doctor, and am I not right? Very curious, I said. I'd like to talk to you. Once again, I was struck by the peculiar, peculiarly thick matting of black hair growing on the, uh, the outsides of his ears. I had not seen anything quite like it on another person. I have never been questioned by a doctor before, he said, but I have no objection. It would be a pleasure to have supper with you. Shall I wait in the car? Yes, please, he said. I must wash myself and get out of these dirty clothes. I told him mm, what my car looked like, and I said I would be waiting outside. He emerged fifteen minutes later, wearing a clean white cotton robe and the usual sandals on his bare feet. And soon the two of us were sitting comfortably in a small restaurant that I sometimes went to because it made the best curry in the city. I drank beer with my curry. Imrat Khan drank lemonade. I am not a writer, I said to him. I am a doctor. But if you will tell me your story from the beginning, if you will explain to me how you developed this magical power of being able to see without your eyes, I will write it down as faithfully as I can, and then perhaps I can get it published in the British Medical Journal or even in some famous magazine. And because I am a doctor and not just some writer trying to sell a story for money, people will be far more inclined to take seriously what I say. It would help you, wouldn't it, to become better known? It would help me very much, he said. But why should you want to do this? Because I am madly cu curious, I answered. That is the only reason. Imrat Khan took a mouth of cu full of curried rice and chewed it slowly. And he said, Very well, my friend. I will do it. Splendid, I cried. Let's go back to my flat as soon as we finish eating, and then we can talk orc, without anyone disturbing us. We finished our meal. I paid the bill. Then I drove Imrat Khan back to my flat. This'll be interesting. How he got his powers. <laughs> Chapter four. In the living room I got out a paper I got out paper and pencil so that I could make notes. I have a sort of private shorthand of my own that I use for taking down the medical history of patients, and with it I am able to record most of what a person says if he doesn't speak too quickly. I think I got just about everything Imrat Khan said to me this evening, word for word, and here it is. I give it to you exactly as he spoke it. <laughs> Here we go. I am an Indian, a Hindu, said Imrat Khan, and I was born in Aknur in Kashmir State in 1905. My family is poor, and my father worked as a ticket inspector on the railway. When I was a bo small boy of 13, an Indian conjurer comes to our school and gives a performance. His name, I remember, is Professor Murr. All conjurers jurors in India call themselves professor, and his tricks are very good. I am tremendously impressed. I think it is a re um, is real magic. I feel, how shall I call it, I feel a powerful wish to learn about this magic myself. So two days later I run away from home determined to find and 
to follow my new hero, Professor Moore. I take all my savings, 14 rupees, I wonder how much that is in American money, and only the clothes I am wearing. I am wearing a white dotty and sandals. This is 1918, and I am 13 years old. I find out that Professor Moore has gone to Lahore, 200 miles away. So all alone, I take, so all alone, I take a ticket, third class, and get, and I get on a train and follow him. In Lahore, I discover the professor. He is working at his conjuring in a very cheap type step show. I tell him of my admiration and offer myself to him as his assi as assistant. He accepts me. My pay? Ah, yes, my pay is eight annas a day. Again, I wonder how much that is in American money. The professor teaches me to do the linking rings trick, and my job is to stand in the street before the theater, dressed in funny clothes, doing the linking rings and calling to the people to come in and see this show. For six whole weeks, this is very fine. It is much better than going to school. But then what a terrible bombshell I received when suddenly it comes to me that there is no real magic in Professor Moore, that all is trickery and quickness of the hand. Immediately the professor is no longer my hero. I lose every bit of interest in my job, but at the same time my whole mind becomes filled with a very strong longing. I long above all things to find out about the real magic and to discover something about the strange power which is called yoga. To do this, I must find a yogi who is willing to let me become his disciple. This is not going to be easy. True yogis do not grow on trees. There are very few of them in the whole of India. Also, they are fanatically religious people. They must practice Buddhism if this is India. Or Hinduism. I, I could be wrong. Therefore, I am to have success in finding a theater. I too would have to pretend to be a very religious man. No, I am actually not religious, and because of that I am what you call a bit of a cheat. I wanted to acquire yoga powers for purely for selfish reasons. <laughs> I wanted to use these powers to get fame and fortune. <laughs> That's not how you do it. Maybe if he practices it, it'll change his personality. <laughs> now this was something the true yogi would despise more than anything in the world. In fact, the true yogi believes that any yogi who misuses his powers will die early and sudden death. A yogi must never perform in public. He must practice his art only in absolute privacy and as a religious service. Otherwise he will be smite smitten to death. This I did not believe, and I still don't. So now my search for a yogi instructor begins. I, up, I leave Professor Moore and go to a town called Armistar in the Punjab, where I join a traveling theater company. I have to make a living while I am searching for the secret, and already I have had success in amateur acting at my school. So for three years I travel with this theater group all over the Punjab, and by the end of it, when I am 16 years old, 16, and a half years old, I am playing top of the bill. All the time I am saving money, and now I have altogether a very great sum, 2,000 rupees. Hmm. I need to look up how much this is in American money. <laughs> it is at the m moment that I hear news of a man called Banjuri Banerjee. This Banerjee, it is said, is one of the truly great yogis of India and he possesses extraordinary yoga powers. Above all, people are telling of how he has required the rare power of levitation, so that when he prays, his whole body leaves the ground and becomes suspended in the air 18 inches from the soil. Aha, I think. This is surely the man for me. This banjuri is the one that I must seek. So at once I take my savings and leave the theater company and make my way to Rikikesh. Ricky on the banks of, of the Ganges, where rumor says that Banjuri is living. For six months I search for Banjur Banerjee. Where is he? Where? Where is Banerjee? Ah oh, yes, they say in Rikesh. Banjuri has certainly been in town, but that is a while ago, and even then no one saw him. And now? 
Now Banerjee has gone to another place. What other place? Ah, well, I say, how can one know that? How indeed? How can, it, how can one know about the movements of such a one as Banerjee? Does he not live a life of absolute seclusion? Does he not? And I say yes. Yes, 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 of course. That is obvious even to me. I spend all my savings trying to find this Banerjee, all except 35 rupees. <laughs> but it is no good. However, I stay in Rikikesh and make a living by doing ordinary conjuring tricks for small groups and such like. These are the tricks I have learned from Professor Moore, and by nature my sleight of hand is very good. Then one day, there I am sitting in the small hotel in Rikikesh, and again I hear talk of the yogi, Banj Banerjee. A traveler is saying how he was has heard that Banerjee is now living in the jungle, not so very far away, but in the dense jungle and all alone. But the where? But where? The traveler is not sure where. Possibly, he says, it is over there, in that direction, north of the town, and he points with his finger. Well, that is enough for me. I go to the market and begin to bargain for hiring a tonga, which is a horse and cart, and the transaction is just being completed with the driver when up comes a man who has been study standing listening nearby, and he says that he too is going in that direction. He asks, can he come part of the way with me and share the cost? I answer, delighted, of course, and off we go. The man and me sitting in the cart, and the driver driving the horse. Off we go along a very small path, which leads straight right through the jungle. And then what truly fantastic luck should happen. I am talking to my companion, and I find that he is a disciple of none other than the great Banerjee himself, and that he is going now on a visit to his master. So straight away I tell him that I would like to become a disciple of the yogi. He turns and looks at me long and slow, and for perhaps three minutes he does not speak. Then he says quietly, No, that is impossible. Oh, all right, I say to myself, we shall see. Then I ask if it is really true that Banerjee levitates when he prays. Yes, he says, that is true, but no one is allowed to observe the thing happening. No one is ever allowed to come near Banerjee when he is praying. So we go on a little further in the Tonga, talking all the time about Banerjee, and I managed by very careful, casual questioning to find out a number of small things about him, such as what time of day he commences with his praying. Then soon the man says, I will leave you here. This is where I dismount. I drop him off and I pretend to drive on along my journey. But around the corner I tell the driver to stop and wait. Quickly I jump down and I sneak back along the road, looking for this man, the disciple of Banerjee. He's not on the road. Already he has disappeared into the jungle. But which way? Which side of the road? I stand very still and listen. I hear a sort of rustling in the undergrowth. That must be him, I tell myself. If it is not him, then it is a tiger. But it is him. I see him ahead. He is going through the thick jungle. There is not even a little path where he is walking, and he is having to push his way between tall bamboos and every kind of heavy vegetation. I creep after him. I keep about 100 yards behind him because I am frightened he may hear me. I can certainly hear him. It is impossible to proceed in silence through very thick, thick jungle, and when I lose sight of him, which is most of the time, I am able to follow his sound. For about half an hour, this tense game of follow the leader goes on. Then suddenly I can no longer hear the man in front of me. I stop and listen. The jungle is silent. I am terrified that I may have lost him. I creep on a little way, and all at once, through the thick undergrowth, I see before me a little clearing, and in the middle of the clearing are two huts. They are small huts built entirely of jungle leaves and branches. My heart jumps and I feel a great surging of excitement inside me because this, I know for certain, is the place of Banerjee, the yogi. The disciple has already disappeared. He must have gone into one of the huts. All is quiet. So now I proceed to make a most careful inspection of the trees and bushes and other things all around. There is a small water hole beside the nearest hut, and I see a prayer mat beside it. And that, I say to myself, is where Banerjee meditates and prays. Close to this water hole, not thirty yards away, there is a large tree, a great spreading baobab 
tree with beautiful thick branches which spread in such a way you can put a bed on them and lie on the bed and still not be seen from underneath. That will be my tree, I say to myself. I shall hide in that tree and wait until Banerjee comes out to pray. Then I will be able to see everything. But the disciples told me that the time of prayer is not until five or six o'clock in the evening. So I have several hours to wait. And therefore, I at once walk back through the jungle to the road and I speak to the Tonga driver. I tell him he too must wait. For this, I have to pay him extra money. But it doesn't matter because I am now so excited, I don't care about anything for the moment. Not even money. Well, that's good. And all through the great noontime heat of the jungle, I sat, I wait beside the Tonga and on through the heavy, wet heat of that afternoon. And then as five o'clock approaches, I make my way quietly back through the jungle to the hut, my heart beating so I can feel it shaking my whole body. I climb up my tree and I hide among the leaves in such a way that I can see, but cannot be seen. And I wait. I wait for 45 minutes. A watch? Yes, I have on a wristwatch. I remember it clearly. It was a watch I won in a raffle, and I was proud to own it. On the face of my watch, it said the maker's name. The Islamia Watch Company. Ludiana. And so with my watch, I am careful to be timing everything that goes on, because I want to get every single detail of this experience. I sit up in the tree, waiting. Then all at once, a man is coming out of the hut. The man is tall and thin. He is dressed in an orange-colored dotty, and he carries before him a tray with brass pots and incense burners. He goes over and sits down cross-legged on the mat by the water hole, putting the tray on the ground before him, and all the movements that he makes seem somehow very calm and gentle. He leans forward and scoops a handful of water from the pool and throws it over his shoulder. He takes the incense burner and passes it back and forth across his chest slowly in a gentle flowing manner. He puts his hand's palm downward on his knees. He pauses. He takes a long breath through his nostrils. I can see him take a long breath and suddenly I can see his face is changing. There is a sort of brightness coming over all his face. A sort of a sort of brightness on his skin and I can see his face is changing. For fourteen minutes he remains quiet, still, it remains quite still in that position. And then as I look at him, I see quite positively, I see his body lifting slowly, slowly, slowly off the ground. He is still sitting cross-legged, the hand's palm downward on the knees, and his whole body is lifting slowly off the ground up into the air. Now I can see daylight underneath him. Twelve inches above the ground he is sitting. Fifteen inches. Eighteen inches. Twenty inches. As soon as he is at least two feet above the prayer mat. And soon he... I mean... And soon he is at least two feet above the prayer mat. I lay quite still up there, in the tree watching. And I keep saying to myself, Now look carefully. Make sure. Be certain that you are seeing correctly. There before you, thirty yards away, is a man sitting in great serenity upon the air. Are you seeing him? Yes, I am seeing him. But are you sure this, there is no illusion? Are you sure there is no deception? Are you sure you are not imagining? Are you sure? Yes, I am sure, I say. I am sure. I stare at him, marveling. For a long while, I keep staring. And then the body is coming slowly down again towards the earth. I see it coming. I see it moving gently downward, slowly downward, lowering to the earth until again his buttocks rest upon the mat. Forty-six minutes by my watch it had been suspended. I timed it. And then for a long, long while, for over two hours, the man remained sitting absolutely still, like a stone person with not the slightest movement. To me it does not seem that he is breathing. His eyes are closed, and there... And still, there is this brightness on his face, and also this slightly smiling look, a thing I have not seen on any other face in all my life since then. At last he stirs. He moves his hands. He stands up. He bends down again. He picks up the tray and goes slowly back to, into the hut. I am wonderstruck. I feel exalted. I forget all caution, and I climb down quickly from the tree and run straight over to the hut and rush in through the door. Banerjee is bending over, washing his feet and hands in a basin. 
His back is towards me, but he hears me and he turns quickly and straightens up. There is a great surprise on his face, and the first thing he says is, How long have you been there? Here. He says it sharply, like he is not pleased. At once I tell the whole truth, the whole story about being up in the tree and watching him, and at the end I tell him there is nothing I want in life except to become his disciple. Please, will he let me become his disciple? Suddenly he seems to explode. He becomes furious and he begins shouting at me. Get out! He shouts. Get out of here! Get out! Get out! Get out! And in his fury he picks up a small brick and flings it at me and it strikes my right leg just below the knee and tears the flesh. I have the scar still. I will show it to you. There you see, just below the knee. The Banerjee, Banerjee's anger is terrible and I am very frightened. I turn and run away. I run back through the jungle to where the Tonga driver is waiting and we drive home to Rikitkesh. But that night I regain my courage. I make for myself a decision and it is this that I will return every day to the hut of Banerjee, and I will keep on and on at him until at last he has to take me on as a disciple, just to get himself some peace. This I do. Each day I go to see him, and each day his anger pours out upon me like a volcano, him shouting and yelling at me standing there frightened, but 